Hi friends, it's Deanna Williston from Our Blooming Catholic Life, and I'm here today with a totally little Franciscan review on sandals. Okay, so I'm getting ready for my Franciscan profession, and I thought I'd be more cool Franciscan-y and start wearing, you know, hardcore sandals, right? <laughs> That's not really what's going on. So I have these moments. You know, we all have moments. Um, and I am not a person who likes feet. I don't like feet. They're gnarly and ugly to me. Probably doesn't help that I have completely flat pancake feet that are very wide I probably have early stages of hammer toes. Like, it's not pretty. You saw in the picture. It's not pretty. Um, and so, it's a thing I don't like to see. I don't like to see feet. I don't like to talk about feet. I don't like to touch feet. And yet, there are these wounded feet of Christ. So, just spending enough time lately with Claire's gaze. I'll put up to remind me to add that um, link for you. And just other moments when you talk about the poor and humble Christ. And then you look down and you see your little broken feet. You know, um, it's kind of an image of the poor and broken Christ to me. And you think of like St. Teresa of Calcutta, you know, Mother Teresa. And her, her feet were so broken and misshapen. She, I think she's one of those people who couldn't even wear shoes anymore by the end um, from her feet. Just from all the walking and everything just just the daily life and the daily sacrifices and we all know whatever happens to our feet seems to go up our skeleton into our sacrifices and you know Christ's feet were pierced and that does it goes up into his body it it is it's almost like his his feet are a metaphor for the rest and and so him washing the feet of the disciples is almost he's washing the whole person right it is it's for the whole person and when he did that and instituted the the priestly order that did flow up from that it flowed up from the most humble bit of them okay so what did i get though uh there's much talk if you go on catholic twitter on the coolest uh sandals to get and whatever it's so funny because it, it was once upon a time a mark of poverty that all you could afford was sandals, right? And and now people tend to buy really super expensive sandals. Now, I'm no different, but that's because I have huge feet concerns. And I'm already, if I don't wear the right shoes, I'm limping pretty heavily around the house. And that keeps me from doing the things that I need to do and the charitable work that I need to do. Would it allow me more time to be introspective and contemplate God yes but I'm a secular Franciscan and I need to take care of my family I need to cook I need to clean I need to be able to do these things as well as all my charitable works and and go to church so I don't have quote that luxury yet maybe when I'm older so what did I get I hardcore thought I'd jump in and go for legit orthotic shoes now, they actually make them, and it's so funny. Look at this totally grandma, grandpa shoe here, but it has all these different inserts, so you can make more room depending on how swelled your foot is or how thick your insole is. Don't worry, you can fit it. I have no idea why this was in the sandals. It has literally nothing to do with the sandals, though. Here are the sandal fitting instructions. You can see they're perfectly lovely little sandals, right? But they have, um, besides this really, it says orthotic sole. This is like super comfy, cushy thing has this extra arch booster in here. Now, how does this work? I'm going to go ahead and take one of my little sandals off. I've only been wearing them for a day and I will show you because this we're starting out here with a bit of a review, right? So totally Velcro. Oh, these come in extra, extra, extra wide. That's one of the reasons I got them. I can't normally get shoes in my regular shoe size because I have to go up a size in length to get the width. Look, they look enormous. So you actually lift it up. It's got Velcro here in the back. Ooh, you can see the nice little gel cushion. And here's the piece I inserted. It's pretty hefty. And this is very firm, hard plastic. See, it's not really, it doesn't like to bend and twist. And so I lifted up the heel. Does the whole thing come out? Somebody's going to ask that. So let me see. Does the whole thing. I don't think. Oh, it does. It does. The toe comes out. I really don't want to do that because if you've ever done that in sandals, 
it's really hard to get them back in normally and I just don't want to try it. So you slip it in. It's kind of funny at this point. It looks like a retainer. But you slip it in. Sorry. Um, it did take me a hot minute to get it exactly as I wanted it because you have to get that Velcro to go back in. Right? And so you just step on it and that should... Did you hear it? It's getting in there. You can see the green. Just a smidgy smidge of it. That's pretty good. Oh, here's the sole on here. Sorry, I got a little bit of smudgy smudge in there. But there's the sole. They're more like a non-skid sole than an off-roading sole. So, mm, we'll see how long that lasts. Uh, I can see here this arch support is not lined up yet, so I need to... That's what's not going in. I didn't have it curved around quite right at that point. Please forgive Brother Blue Jay. I don't know what's up with him. He's on the alert about something. Oh, I see what it was. This little hook bit here caught in the piece for the strap. So watch for that. I didn't have that last time when I put this in, but I did this time. So if you're popping that in, um, yeah, now it went straight in. So it was just caught there for a second. Um, so slip that bad boy back on. Oh yeah, so it adjusts here, across here. Sorry. Um, this is also Velcro, but this is just stretchy. So if it's not quite stretchy enough for your wide, that's why you have to make sure you get your true width or it's not going to work. Um, and they did have a way to measure that online and give you that. And then this back here as well, this is just stretchy. It's not going to change, um, but you can make it a little bit tighter or looser. And it's really odd then because then there's these extra buckles. I have literally no idea. It's an extra Velcro piece, so maybe I can extend one of these more I don't know it's a little velcro buckle piece there so that's a little extra um I have been wearing them for a day I wore them for about three hours around the house um to be comfortable in them before I tried going outside and I've walked the dog twice since with them um I just walked on roads mostly so I can't say about off-roading yet um I will say they're amazingly comfortable and yet in the morning um, I had them sitting at the foot of the bed with just that main strap undone. I was able to slip my foot right in, jump up. Wonderful, lovely. Um, stay tuned. You know I'll come back if they don't work or whatever and give you an update on that. And I did want to talk to you a little bit more. Um, this is not really a book review on this book, but we're going to talk about it just a smidge. Poverty and Joy, The Franciscan Tradition. This is one of the books they recommend in your secular Franciscan formation. And so there was really only a tiny bit of it that I was supposed to read for our final chapter in the journey um, my journey is here if you've never seen the journey um, be prepared if you're using this book the cover doesn't stay a lot of time the pages are falling out i think it's too many curly cues in the spine maybe fewer so there aren't so many really 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 tiny holes right next to each other hint um, but we're way here you can see in the back of the book and so one of the readings was out of here today. So it's a regular lesson book, right? And then there's all these readings. So we did read an encyclical as well. Uh, the Introduction to Deus Caritas Ex. Est. And here in the Poverty and Joy, we were supposed to read the chapter, just two pages in the chapter, The Lord Led Me Among Them. And that is really about going in with the lepers. And we had talked about this during my retreat, my profession retreat as well. So I wanted to share a little bit of insights on that. Francis uses the word sweetness for God. You are all our sweetness. God is delectable and sweet. In the Testament, Francis talks about his first taste of this sweetness, a savoring of the presence of God. Now the Testament was written, literally, it was like Francis's last will in Testament. It was something he left to the brothers as he was dying. And he said this famous quote, While I was in sin, it seemed very bitter to me to see lepers. The Lord led me among them, and I showed mercy to them. And when I left them, that which seemed bitter to me was changed into the sweetness of soul and body. So I'm kind of hoping these, you can see with the sandals, it's something that's very bitter to me. Looking at feet is very bitter to me. And I'm hoping that it's going to become something a little bit more sweet. Now, this book goes into... Some of this and some of this I'm getting from um, Father Stephen King from this this weekend where people aren't entirely sure what actually happened. There were lepers in the time of Francis. This book says that it, it was truly leprosy, that there was actually, um, say, yes, the, the actual 
former mayor of Assisi had actually gone back into the historical records. And they do say that there were town officials who went house to house looking for white blotches on the skin. And that is one of the very early signs of Hansen's disease, also called leprosy. And so if they found you with that mark, you were, you were taken away from town. You were given a funeral. Um, I had heard that the funeral was actually going to be in your hometown. No, the funeral's in the hospital chapel. That's when you're marked as dead. They would probably sprinkle you with dirt from the local cemetery. And they would tell you that God is going to be merciful for you. The church is going to pray for you. And the charity of the townspeople will support you. I, if you were found to have leprosy, they were stealing all your property. Stealing, I don't know. They were using it to care for you um, in your end days. So all that money would go into the hospital. You had to wear ash-colored cloth. So I'm guessing a very dark gray. And while people say they were given bells, apparently in Assisi, they actually gave you a wooden clapper like the ones they use on Good Friday. Um, and then there's rules as well. You don't touch things with their hands. They weren't allowed to touch a lot of things with their hands. Um, because there was a huge amount of contagion, leprosy is still somewhat mysterious. We mostly know what it comes from, but it's this bacteria, and it seems that you have to be repeatedly exposed to it to develop it. So we know Servitagon Jai Bradburn did not ever get leprosy. And yet there are other people who did. St. Damien of Malachi, right? He did contract leprosy. So when you cared for him, it was always a risk you knew you were taking. You know, first Christians had full out martyrdom for the faith. Then they ran away to the desert. Then it seems they were hiding themselves away in monasteries and some icky areas, right? Uh, like swamps and things. And, and now you could do that service by working with lepers. And so that Francis literally... Did that? So this is the contention. Did Francis literally go and work in a leprosy? Or was it this mystical experience? And this book goes into more why 2nd Chilano has it different than 1st Chilano. Because um, in 1st Chilano, he went among the lepers. It, like actually worked in the hospital. And the second he encountered a leper on the road. And this book does go into possibly why that story changed or did it. Um... And then we have the major life of Francis with by St. Bonaventure in 1260 and goes in it and says, you know, it was really that Francis had to conquer himself as well. He had to get over himself, basically. It wasn't that he had to get woke, but he had to conquer himself and get over that. Um, and I find it very interesting in this book when it talks about it, that it, the end of this chapter then is leprosy and liberation. In the context of Latin America, theologies of Liberation, Leonardo Boff has pointed to a way of recovering the importance of Francis's compassion. And they hyphenate that word because it's participating in the passion of Christ. Um, so he has a book, St. Francis, a Model for Human Liberation, with a subtitle, a reading beginning with the poor, suggesting that the, the way to read the story of St. Francis in today's tech context of global impoverishment is to live not only with the poor, but for them. So Francis li literally lived among the leper scene. In fact, the early friars often did that. But they're saying, no, it has to do with liberation theology from the view of the poor. And it's bringing it back to its original context. Now, I'm going to contrast that a little bit because there's leprosy in South America. He's acting like there's not. There is. In fact, Brazil has, I looked at the latest um, research I could find, actually has Brazil as having it as a higher rate than India. And India's pretty high right now. If you have not looked at that, um, India has quite an epidemic of leprosy right now. And so why in Brazil? Brazil is, is kind of distinctly. Now it is throughout South America. There's a number of countries that have it. Brazil is notable for the armadillo. Armadillo is one of the known vectors, carriers. In East Africa, I think there's a particular kind of monkey that carries it. In many areas, we don't know. But in areas where there's a vector, it is more prevalent. Now, you may say, hey, there's armadillos in the South, in, in America, like in Florida, Texas. And yes, there is. And people do get leprosy from it. But technically, they get Hansen's disease because we're a first world country. People recognize the symptoms more easily because they have more access to medical care. And it's normally cured right away because it is curable right away. Um... It's a cocktail of antibiotics and medicine and you get better. But in the time that you don't get that medicine, there's irreparable damage done. And that's why we still have leprosy clinics. 
So in an area where there is a vector, where there is social stigma for having leprosy, and where there is a lack of adequate medical care, um, those areas still today have leprosy. And while he's proposing uh, liberation theology, which can get a little dangerous and political and can literally sometimes be taken to mean a political uprising, um, the model that we have at Matemwa in Zimbabwe, where Servant of God John Bradburn was, was caring for the whole person. And in fact, so there are people living there still with leprosy as well as other conditions. Um, I think there's some with epilepsy and different mental illnesses. But as well as they live there and their families live in, so in the, in the care center itself where they can get a higher level of care, but oftentimes their families live in huts around them. So it is a community. And they ask for things like they ask for access to water. So right now, Well for Africa with the Secular Franciscan Order Worldwide is working on building them um, water, a water borehole. Now with Well for Africa, there normally has to be a Secular Franciscans on the ground. So in that area of Africa that's willing to take responsibility to make sure that like the water source doesn't get, you know, kept to one person. It has to be an open water source that's for all. There are certain conditions that need to be met in order for the wells to get put in. And so Matemwa meets that criteria. And so we're working on raising funds right now for water borehole. That's well for Africa. Well for the number four, Africa. Um, as well as they're trying to become more sustainable. Having that water <coughs> excuse me, is going to make them more sustainable. They'll be able to grow crops. And one of the crops, and they would love to grow, is to have a mango growth. Mangoes are very, very high in, in vitamins that make they give you a baseline of good health. And so that's going to help with a lot of the different conditions besides the expensive medicine. It's going to be cheaper because not everybody is going to need the super expensive medicines, right? Because we at least have a baseline of health. Now, vitamin A and some of those vitamins are very cheap. You have to get them into the country and stuff and it's more logistical. So it's not always expensive, but sometimes it's logistics. Mangoes, very high in that. And you, not only do you have fresh mangoes, but you can dry them and have them year round. And should they be able to produce a surplus, they could sell them to the local community. So they'd have an income and the local community would have access to this vitamin rich food. Um, what else are they looking to do? They are still looking to buy more chickens to have um, their chicken program so they could have eggs, they could have little baby chicks, and they could have chicken as fresh meat to eat. Again, fresh meat, such a blessing, right? Um, what else are they doing? I think they have a piggery. They may also be working on something with fish. So you can see again why they really need fresh water and as well other staple crops. Um, and so those are things they are looking for so that they become a little bit more sustainable. Um, of course, we would love to keep providing for them. You know, the, the John Bradburn Memorial Society, that is their main goal, is to provide for Matemwa. John's cause for sainthood is kind of a vehicle for caring for others. And so we're trying to raise money to get the mango trees, to get the chickens right now for the, the well. And so those are ways that we can help people with leprosy. In areas that have the vector, there may be some education needed as well as alternate meat sources. If people are eating armadillos for food, <clears throat> that's going to be a danger. Can there be an alternate food source we can help them get? So we need to look at solutions. And liberation theology very much looks at the, the problems of the people and takes our theology from the bottom up. But sometimes we do need to advise people. There may be resources that they just don't know about yet. Um, and that's not that. <laughs> and, and I don't mean that in a patriarchal colonizing kind of way. I mean that in a sometimes I don't know things, but talking to my friends, I learn new things um, kind of way. And that's the reason we have stress fellowship. It's the reason we have secular Franciscan fraternities and we have those fraternities in multiple levels. Secular Franciscans often are very much out in the world doing charitable works as a part of their daily life. Um, so we're doing our daily life and all these charitable works. And we need to be sure we're taking time to grow in our formation and to refresh as well. And that is a lot of what secular Franciscans do for each other in fraternity. It's a place to gather and meet and have that time of fellowship and formation. Um, and then the levels keep us in check. Are you being Franciscan enough? Like sometimes when you're by yourself, you can get a little wacky, right? And I'll insert that picture here. I'm going to. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so 
some of the older Franciscan rules, actually, secular Franciscan rules, actually determined what colors you could wear even. Um, thankfully, a secular Franciscan rule does not do that, and so we can be a little joyful with our coloring. Um, and yeah, so it helps you to get, you can be a little wacky. Let's be real, most secular Franciscans are a little wacky. Um, but we're normally very peaceful, joyful people. And the more friends and relationships we build with other secular Franciscans, I think the more grounded and peaceful and in the Lord we become. When we encounter the body of Christ, it helps us just a little bit more to become the body of Christ. But you don't want to get you don't want to get lost in that and start being your own ideas. Um, and that's why we have fellowship and formation. I hope this made sense to you. God bless you, friends. Um, hey, what are your favorite Franciscan footwear? <laughs> Put it in the comments below. But also tell us why and where you got them if you can. God bless you, friends. Bye.